Moving back to opposition, I'd like to welcome Simon Baines, MP, to the floor. Simon has been the Member of Parliament for Clearwood <coughs> South since 2019. He has served as, um, he, is, <laughs> he is currently Parliamentary Private Secretary to DCMS and was formerly Minister of Justice and Tackling Immigration. He's also a former chairman of KUKA, and far more importantly than all of that, he's a former chairman of this society. Simon, you have the ears of the House. Madam President, it is an honour and a pleasure to rise to speak this evening, um, particularly as, and this is making me feel very old, it is 40 years since I last spoke in the Union at my presidential debate in June 1982. And it was here, also here 40 years ago, that as chairman of CUCA, I chaired a memorable speaker meeting with the then chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Geoffrey Howe. Um, Sir Geoffrey was speaking from there. I was seated where the secretary is seated there. And during the course of the um, meeting, I noticed um, a gentleman sitting there who had this plastic bag, which he was um, uh, maneuvering the, the edges of, and I thought he's going to throw something at the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which he duly did, which was a bag of flour. <laughs> but luckily, I heroically intercepted the bag of flour, so it went on me rather than the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> I came up to Cambridge in 1979, in the same year that Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister. And those years were an exciting time to be a Conservative, particularly here, where um, most of the leading members of the Cabinet came to speak in the Union. And it was, of course, Mrs Thatcher's great electoral success which led to the genesis of New Labour, in a pattern which is arguably repeating itself now in British politics. The 1983 general election, for Labour, led by Michael Foote, was a disaster, just as the 2019 election was a disaster for Labour, led by Jeremy Corbyn. An election which resulted in my winning the previously safe Labour seat of Clwyd South, a seat which Boris Johnson, incidentally, lost by 13,810 votes in 1997. As he said subsequently, I fought Clwyd South and Clwyd South fought back. <laughs> So now Keir Starmer is pushing Labour back into the centre ground of politics, just as Neil Kinnock, John Smith and Tony Blair did with New Labour. In essence, New Labour was a necessary reboot by the Labour Party to ensure its electoral survival by dumping its left-wing policies and adopting many of the policies of the successful Conservative Party, a process which is happening again today with Labour supporting Brexit and in truth, many of Rishi Sunak's economic policies. So Madam President, I agree that new Labour saved the Labour Party, but I strongly disagree that it saved Britain. On the contrary, I believe that Labour did significant damage to Britain, particularly in its conduct of the Iraq war. Now we've listened to some fantastic um, speeches this evening um, from Katie and Coco, I'm um, proposing the motion, from Benjamin and from the floor, from many of you on the floor. And I have to say, it's a, it's a much higher quality than, than it was in my day. So congratulations to you all. And it's also wonderful to see the union looking so great and in such good health um, financially and in terms of morale. So many congratulations to you all for making this wonderful institution um, get stronger and stronger as the years go by. Now, we've touched on the, the Blair, um, Tony Blair's um, involvement in the Iraq war. And as one of the speakers said earlier on, we shouldn't just put it on the shoulders of Tony Blair. It, it was also the entire cabinet who supported it. And I believe that that legacy was toxic in terms of the Iraq war, as was outlined in the findings of the Chilcot Inquiry, which were published on the 6th of July, 2016, and the war did great damage to our reputation and standing in the world. But before looking at the Chilcot um, findings in more detail, I would like to contrast Blair's handling of the Iraq war with that of Margaret Thatcher's handling of the Falklands war, which is very much present in my mind, um, speaking again here in the Union, because it was, of course, 40 years ago um, that the Falklands conflict took place. 
And I was president um, during that time, and I had a debate about the Falklands War, which um, the, the result of which was published on the front page of the national press and showed strong support um, for the government's handling of the conflict. And they were, of course, very different conflicts. But Mrs. Thatcher, admirably supported by Michael Foote, I may say, as the leader of the Labour Party at that time, ensured that the Falklands War was conducted with very widespread political support in the UK. And of course, Tony Blair would have been wise to have looked to one of his Labour predecessors, notably um, Harold Wilson, who kept Britain out of the Vietnam War and I think he should have paid far more attention to Harold Wilson and his policy. And indeed, I think that policy gets far too little credit um, within the, the scope of modern politics. But returning to the Chilcot inquiry, I'm just going to quickly run through the main um, findings because they were very damning. And I think they go to the heart of why I feel that um, New Labour certainly did not save Britain. And those, those main findings were that military action had taken place before peaceful options had been exhausted when Iraq posed no imminent threat to the UK. The reliability of evidence on Iraq's supposed war, weapons of mass destruction was overstated and that evidence turned out to be flawed. The legal justification was, and I quote, far from satisfactory. Rather than bolstering the UN, the UK helped to undermine it. UK armed forces were poorly prepared, and that was one of the absolutely worst things about um, sending people into that war without proper preparation. The warnings about the consequences of removing, removing Saddam Hussein were not taken seriously enough, and the UK overestimated its ability to influence the US. I consider that to be a very damning indictment of new labor. Now, the second area I want to touch on is immigration. Yes, certainly. There are many legitimate criticisms in Washington, you know, share many of them. some water. But the vast majority of them, all but two MPs from the Conservative Party, voted in favour of the Trump. It's all by the good the Conservatives, just like Americans, have the same mistaken belief about weapons and mass destruction. If the Conservatives were in government, not Labour, we would have still got into the law, but we wouldn't have lifted to the entire party. That is a very fair point, and when I was writing this speech, I was thinking the very same thing that the Conservative Party did support. But if you talk to the people at the top of the Conservative Party at the time, they were quite reliant upon the intelligence that was being provided by the government, and that had a very major effect on their decision. Now, if they were actually privy to the intelligence, which was, in terms of being sufficient um, cause to go into war, which is pretty threadbare, as has been proved by the Chilcot inquiry, then I don't think that the Conservative Party would have come quite so strongly. But I take your point, and I think it's a fair point. And indeed, I mean, in, from my own point of view, I mean, my father was a, was a military man. I mean, he was a professional soldier and um, a, a noted... Um, military historian, and he strongly opposed the Iraq war. And there were many people of, of all political persuasions who actually did oppose it. But I take your main point, but that doesn't in any way um, excuse the new Labour from the, the, the really very serious mistake that they made. Just going to touch briefly on immigration. And here it's really about the, um, the, the not imposing transi transitional restrictions on the free movement rights of workers from the accession states when they joined the EU. On the 1st of May 2004, the EU admitted 10 new members. Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And upon accession, all citizens of the 10 new member states gained the right to travel freely and live anywhere in the enlarged EU. However, for up to seven years, the existing member states could restrict the right to work of those from the eight Central and Eastern European accession countries, which the UK, unlike many other EU countries, chose not to do. And this is widely um, viewed as having contributed over time to the public's concern about immigration and to have fed directly into the Brexit debate. Now, yes, certainly. Um, I know it's easy to get wrapped up in sort of post-Brexit immigration rhetoric. 
But these immigrants that came in played a big role in ensuring the UK, for example, has less of a problem with an Asian population. They contribute to economic growth, and they're in large part behind some of the economic successes of the 2000s, 2010s. So don't you think as, a, as a, the UK actually having that wave of immigration, in fact, saved it from some of the consequences of aging population and economic anemia that we saw in countries which did not have that wave of immigration? I think you make your point very well, and I agree with you to the extent that those people that have come into the country have uh, brought great benefits to us all. I, I totally agree with that. But the point I'm making is that the, the handling of that issue at a particularly sensitive time was one that the Labour, that New Labour, should have taken greater care over, just as they did in most of the other EU countries. But your, your central point, I accept but the handling is what I'm getting at. And the third reason for my opposition is that New Labour bequeathed a treacherous economic legacy. Now, I think we've debated this um, uh, to, to great, a uh, great extent, so I'm not going to prolong the debate on it. But what I would say um, to Coco is that actually, if you look at the facts of what was happening <coughs> to the economy, there was a rising budget deficit um, in, in um, the UK ahead of the financial crisis. And that was a deliberate loosening of the, of, of the um, spending um, propositions by the government. And that meant that when the financial crisis came, the UK was in a worse position than other countries um, to deal with it. And then the final point I make, and I've got very little time left, I can see the clock ticking away, is really on devolution. I'm a, I'm a Welsh MP. I've lived in Wales most of my life. I've, all, I've done all my political activities in Wales, which might explain, as a Conservative, why I've come to the um, Chamber of the House of Commons relatively late in life. Um, I care passionately about Wales. Um, the decision on devolution in the referendum was carried by 50.3% of the vote. And I'm not saying that we should abolish the Senate, but I am saying that the advent of devolution has created huge instability within the Union of the United Kingdom. And the reason for that, again, goes directly back to New Labour. Yes, certainly. You wouldn't even be a Welsh MP, so doesn't that kind of... No. I'm unfortunately not, because your point isn't true, because the, the, I'm a member of the UK Parliament. Um, devolution affects the Senate in Wales, and so it's a separate political system. Sorry? No, no, they're totally separate. No, but anyway. No, what, what the point I'm making. Uh, that's very much up to Simon. He just, he's not required to accept cross chat. No, I'm more than happy to accept any um, points of information. Can, can I just finish off the. <laughs> Can I finish off the lady's point? No, the, the, the point I'm making is that devolution has created massive instability within the constitution of the UK, and particularly in Scotland. And part of the reason for that is the attitude of the Welsh Labour government, um, because they flirt the whole time with, uh, with the independence within Wales. Um, they're actually in coalition with Plaid Cymru. They hardly ever actually speak up for the union. So the way in which the political parties, um, and it's the same with the SNP, obviously, um, massively so, the way in which the, the political parties in Wales and Scotland who are in power actually behave directly endangers the stability of the union. So that's, that's the point I'm making. Yes? Um, would you not say you've just said this quite hypocritically, noting the fact that the Scottish Conservatives in the 07 to 11 SME market station supported Scottish budgets and supported yeah. the school of SNP on confidence votes. Would you also say that's hypocritical? It's also quite hypocritical that the whole policy of Conservative government for 12 years has been to entrench the system of wholly separating UK law into what is devolved and what is not devolved, instead of having a set of concurrent powers. And would you not say as well that the fact that Mark Gregory, the man who you just criticised, was a person who came up with a much better plan to share power in the United Kingdom through a council of ministers, I believe his paper was written in 2019, and it was the principal idea adopted about six months ago by the government.
I, I've been advised to conclude, so why don't we... <laughs> I, I'm more than happy to discuss this. This is one of my, you know, the great interests as a Welsh MP. I'm more than happy to discuss it, it with you later. But I think I've made my point about the instability of the union. So, in conclusion, Madam President, I strongly oppose this motion as new Labour saved the Labour Party, but it certainly did not save Britain, to which it bequeathed a corrupted foreign policy massive economic problems and constitutional instability and social problems at the very heart of the United Kingdom. Thank you.